glad to be with you here. This is the uh, episode 50 of, I just said that, but it's the 50th episode of the commercial free broadcast on the No Say Project here on my YouTube channel, which thanks to everybody, do appreciate it. Uh, getting to the 10K subs, that that is great. And it uh, seems to, you know, we're picking up a little more steam than usual. So uh, look, uh, that's that's always good news, always great to have new people. Uh, just a quick comment, I, I know we've got a lot of new people apparently that are in the chat and it's always great and it's the Skype chat. And uh, I'm going to do my best to spend some time in the chat this afternoon after the big show. So I will probably do video of that also so since we got everything set up so it's easy enough to um, to get that posted so we'll definitely check that out uh, so yeah uh, join us uh, look for more video after the show yeah so if you uh, uh, are interested in doing role-playing want to get an idea of what we're doing there I'm gonna try to get at least you know 10 minutes after the broadcast here today, and uh, sorry, and, and field questions and concerns, expect, you know, for people who are new, uh, and this is about defending ourselves effectively against bureaucrats. Okay, uh, challenging their arguments and their claims against us, sticking, uh, keeping the burden of proof on them without accepting any sacred cows, because that's generally what most people will do. That's what judges and prosecutors and defense lawyers. That's what they expect. You're just going to give them a free pass in that. I say Abba Fangul. That's the technical term for that. No, we do not give them any free passes. So before we go, remember we have Libertopia. Uh, Libertopia uh, uh, 2018. It's in a few months in May 2018. It will be uh, May 3rd through the 6th. For some reason, I just can't seem to get into... Uh, I'm trying to talk too fast, and we do have an hour. So... Um, Remember, go to libertopia.org today and register, and uh, hopefully we'll see you out there because I'm going to be bringing the Les Paul. Yes, we'll be bringing the trusty Les Paul. So we should be getting a jam going and playing some blues, so definitely check that out. Uh, yeah, real quick, uh, the next video after, well, probably before we get this video posted tomorrow, I get the audio up at markstevens.net today. Uh, the... Tyranny Spotlight on Cheryl Hardy uh, there in uh, Dallas, uh, well, Fort Worth, uh, Tarrant County. Uh, should have that up by tomorrow morning. Uh, a lot more information on her than we had on the previous one, Stephen Myrie. And so uh, I have spoken with someone, in, a public information officer for the county attorney there in Tarrant County, and they're supposed to get me in touch with the uh, lawyers who handle psyche vows. So they weren't able to tell me any information regarding if Judge Hardy or any judge in there gives information to the psychiatrist, the psychologist. In this case, it was Dr. Barry Norman who hung up the phone on me. A 16-second phone call, which was mostly me introducing myself and saying what my business was, what I was wanting to ask him. So uh, he slammed the phone down on me rather quickly, which was uh, pretty nice of him. And that leads you to believe, like, look, why, if I'm asking for just the, the procedure and, and how they go about doing their things, why would he feel it necessary to hang the phone up on me like that? And just, just be a professional. Oh, wait. He's getting paid by the county, so yeah, I caught myself there. So hopefully, we'll get some. Inf I'll get some information tomorrow. Uh, I did find out that. The best we can do in Texas as far as a state or county agency to report the mental fitness of a judge is the Judicial Conduct Commission. That's usually a joke. I'm still going to draft up a, a, a complaint. I'll make it available at markstevens.net. If you want to download it, you want to add your name to it, more than welcome. That's great. But I'm also going to be sending it to the county commissioners, and I'm going to be getting a copy to the insurance company and give them a heads up about this woman. Now, maybe, maybe if they say, see how unhinged this woman is, that uh, they'll be able to let her know, hey, before you cost the county any money, okay, we got to let you know, you can't throw people in jail just for arbitrary reasons. If you think they have a legitimate psychological problem, that's one thing. But just because they're asking questions, no, we can't have that. 
Maybe they, who knows? And I did find out that unfortunately we've missed the deadline by a few weeks. Nobody can put their hat in the ring. She is running on a post. She is going to get elected again. So we need to get some media attention in the area. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen. Maybe it's just going to have to be someone like Bow and other people that are in Tarrant County. Go to a county commissioner's meeting. Bring up what this woman did. Let them know she puts people in jail for asking questions. Okay, that is psychopathic in nature, certainly antisocial, and that's a callous disregard for other people. So uh, I'll give more information on that as it comes. We'll see. I uh, want to get to the phones here. We've got Ron in Vegas. Welcome back to the No Stay Project. Hey, Mark, it's Ron again. You got good news uh, for us today? Uh, a little bit, a little. No, not really. Actually, I have questions about. I have been getting a remedy with your methods, though. A lot of the times, the prosecutors know what's coming, and then that I just tell them if they drop it far enough to where I'm willing to pay, or I'll take it to trial. And the, most some of the times, they've been dropping it low enough, so that's, I've been cool enough to walk away with that. But um, it's been a few times I went in there and just got, you know, you know how it goes. The, pro- the judge and the pro- prosecutor never says anything. Judge finds me guilty. I ask for evidence. All they present is a ticket. Uh, I object and ask for, this is not evidence. And then I'm asking, when you ask the cop, does he know that the their laws apply to me before stopping me? He was, oh, yeah, well, you were driving on the roads in Nevada. You know, and then when you ask another question, they object for the, and, and, and they always, overrule your objections and they always sustain the uh, prosecute you know how it goes but tomorrow i have a status check for a appeal i file i mean not a not an appeal i file i have a status check for a case that i was a uh, judgment of eight hundred dollars on of no registration no license and she she, she told me to stay out of trouble and eight hundred dollars this was in uh september of last year i'm sorry this was in august of last year Okay, I filed an appeal, but uh, I still have a status check for this court date tomorrow. Now, what's going to happen at this court date tomorrow, even though I filed an appeal on it? Is she still going to be expecting the $800 of me to stay out of trouble? Yeah, unless you have a stay of proceedings from either the trial court or the court of appeals, they're going to go ahead and do what they're going to do. I know it's, it, it, it's, it, it's one of my pet peeves that... You can, a lot of times, depending on what they do with the, with the lower type of, uh, you know, severity, you know, misdemeanors, the fine or the jail time uh, is, is you're going to do the jail time or pay the fine way before the appeal is even processed. So you can win your appeal and it can show that it was a malicious prosecution. It never should, you're never going to get the jail time back. And you know, so it, so that's where, what you know, by putting you in, I could see if it was murder or rape, someone, it was violent. You got to keep these people away from society. And, and if the evidence is overwhelming, yes, I, that's an exception. But for nonviolent stuff, the idea of putting someone in jail for 15 days when it's going to be 15 months for the appeal to pr- process, you can't, you moot the appeal. There's no reason to do the appeal if you've already done the time because you can't remedy it. And that's the thing. They're not supposed to be, you know, they have no jurisdiction over moot questions. So if they can't provide a remedy, that's one of the prongs, three prongs of, uh, of uh, standing. Uh, if, if, there is, if, if you've already done the time and, and uh, the appeal cannot remedy the errors, they have to throw it out. So it's, it's something that is built into the system. And, uh, it, you know, it, it would take a tremendous amount of work to try to get that remedied, and the courts would probably just overrule it anyway. So, yeah, what you would have to do is, is, is let them know that your chance of success on appeal is very high, and that while you are staying out of trouble, to, requ- to require the payment of money is not only a hardship, but would moot your appeal. But I have gotten other tickets since this case. And then you got a problem. They're, they're going to they're going to want that money tomorrow, or you're going to have to go into some kind of payment program because you don't have time to file a motion to stay the proceedings. See, if you called last week or two weeks ago, I would have been able to tell you file a motion with the tri- with the appellate court to stay the proceedings so that they can't even conduct a status hearing because now they're going to be expecting you to be you know you're going to be on the hook for that that eight hundred. They're definitely going to know about that ticket though. 
Yeah, I, I've got plenty of tickets since then, many. Wow. Well, that, yeah, you, you got to, you got to, when people, you know, when you guys are going through this, especially with an appeal, you got to remember that to st- to stop them from executing on that judgment, you have to get a stay of proceedings. Mm-hmm. And we've gotten them before. It's not like there's no, we've even gotten in tax cases with the, against the IRS. So uh, it, it's still worth doing. Yes, they are rejected, mo- you know, more times than not. But it's still worth putting in and le- and and at least taking the chance that the appellate court is going to step in and stop them, because you could put in there that they're mooting the appeal. So again, you're not a violent offender. Uh-huh. You're, you're, there's no reason. There's no prejudice whatsoever to the state. There's no prejudice to them if they have to wait for the appeal to be processed. That's what I was. That's what I was thought that everything waits until the appeal process is done. I had no clue that I would still be on the hook for that for either one of those. That it depends on where you are. So, you know, sometimes it, it is automatic, and you know, say with murder trials, it, there's automatically a stay proceedings when you appeal a murder trial uh, conviction. Uh, but these things, no, they let it go. They they don't give a damn. Unless you get a, a specific stay of proceedings from the appellate court, they don't give a damn. They're gonna they're gonna go forward anyway. They just don't give a damn. Some places, just as a matter of, of professional courtesy, for lack of a better term, they won't they won't execute on their judgment while it is on appeal. But I always err on the side that uh, or assume that they're not going to give a damn. And you can raise the issue tomorrow and say, look, the matter is on appeal. And the fact that there was no evidence whatsoever and such gross due process violations, uh, my chance of success on appeal are very, very strong. And I would and say at least wait until after the appeal has been, you know, appeals have been exhausted before you try to execute on his judgment. Oh, it's because I wasn't going to go. You don't go. There's going to be a warrant for your arrest. It's just going to escalate. So I would recommend that you show up on time and yeah, and ready okay. to ready to and and just argue like we've been talking about. There's a very strong chance of success on appeal. There's almost as long as they review the issues that are raised. There's no way that this won't be uh, reversed. And you can go through some of the some of the errors. You deny me due process because you deny me a fair trial because you accepted the testimony of the police officer as it was the uh, gospel truth. Uh, you took the ar- uh, arguments of the prosecutor as if they were absolutely irrefutably true. You you, you allowed them to engage in misconduct, and uh, see what they say. Now you could just you know they 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 made this you know it's happened like I said it's happened before they could just. Say, all right, it is on appeal. You're right. Okay, we're going to reserve judgment until we'll set for another status hearing in six months, and you know, hopefully, the appeal is is uh, has been done. So. And if not, they're going to want the eight hundred or and take me into custody. Well, they may not take you into custody. You may have to fill out a financial form to make payments. Oh, wait. I, I I know. This is why we have to. Stay on top of these and not plan to just not show up, but but look at what kind of remedies there are to be able to stop this, you know, to stop them from proceeding. And unfortunately, since it's tomorrow, you have absolutely no time to get a motion to stay in. Even if you filed an emergency mm-hmm. one at eight o'clock in the morning, chances are the appellate court's not going to hear it until. Well, they're not going to probably hear it the same day. Right. That's. I, so I'm when sorry. I do file a motion to stay, where do I? Well, I file it with the appellate. You'd file with, with the, the yeah right. The, You'd file the with the appellate court. court. Right, whoever I appealed it to, because I do have another one out on appeal, I, and I'm uh, just I'm in the midst of ordering those transcripts for that one. Another judgment against me, so I need to put it stay on that judgment immediately, right? Wow, that yeah, just you, absolutely. Last December. Whatever's on appeal, you want to put a motion in to stay the stay the proceedings in the trial court. A motion to stay the the judgment. So, and I get that off the civil law website out here where I'm at, huh? You can email me. I can send you a, a template. Okay. Yeah, because I remember the template. Uh, now, now, what what happens with the? I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up so much of your call. Just last question. Um, when I when I I I, I um file my appeal, they ask for the transcripts. I file my transcripts. Now, what happens next? Well, you you need to get the transcripts and use that, and it'll be in the appendix 
which accompanies your opening brief. And this way, what you're able to do when you're making arguments and, and you have supporting evidence, you have to point to what page in the transcript so-and-so said, you know, the judge said X and the prosecution said this. So you, you, you need to have their statements from the transcript uh, to be able to, you know, back up your argument. So if your argument is that the witness was declared incompetent, you need to have in there, I'm just throwing this out, you need to have in there where in the transcript that particular exchange happened. And what? So let's say on page 16, the prosecution objected to their own witness, claiming they weren't qualified to give legal conclusions. And, and then it's right there for the judge to look in the transcript and verify. We have to have our evidence to verify what we're claiming. We don't get that same free pass the judge gives to the prosecutor. So I have to create a brief. Yeah, I have a template for that too. And a template means I just have to enter in my certain stuff or it's just a basically show me how it's done. It gives you the format that it has to be in and it gives you a general guideline on the errors that could have been committed and should have been committed if you follow the script right. So we have a denial of cross-examination, uh, lack of evidence proving jurisdiction, the witness was impeached and they took the evidence anyway. So those are the basic issues that are in there. So they may or may, some of them may match, some of them may not. So you take what, what is applicable and you have to put in your statement of facts as to you know, the name of the judge, the prosecutor, the police officer, and you have to put in there what happened at the trial. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you have, when you make the statements, then you, you have your reference in the record where, where the judges, the reviewing judges can get that. And right, the page and the, 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 the line number. Damn, so I, I, all I did was turn in transcripts. I haven't even made a brief. Yeah, well, I, I have... I have a, a template for that. Well, that's all I can do for you today. So get me get with me off air, and then okay, I can get, Mark, I can get you those you templates. Much. Okay. All right. I appreciate the call, Ron. And good luck tomorrow. Let me know oh, what happens. Good. Leave me a message at markstevens at mail.com and let me know what happened. So I uh, appreciate the call. Let's go to another caller uh, from my neck of the woods. We got Paul in New York City. Paulie, how you doing today? <laughs> Hey, Mark, a uh, long-time caller and fan, um, or what kind of, yeah, I guess both. I've called you a few times. Actually, uh, these days, though, I'm going by my middle name, Adam. I haven't changed my uh, stuff yet, though. If you could call me Adam, that'd be great. Um, first of all, thank you so much for all the work that you do and all the information you make. Say that again? Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for all the work that you do. It's invaluable, you know, to bring this information to the people and, and give us our power back in this uh, psychopathic system. Um, so thank you for that. Well, I, thank, I appreciate that. Glad I can help. Yeah, Glad no, I can I still help. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're, the, you're the guy who I tell everybody about, like, you got to listen to this guy's state, uh, radio station. He knows all about the IRS and the fraud and the this and the that. So um, I'm actually calling today about two questions. Uh, Okay. So the first is actually very similar to your previous caller. I have uh, three tickets that I got um, a, a little bit over a month ago because my registration was expired. And um, due to financial hardship, I went to pay it actually the day it expired, but there was uh, tickets that I didn't know about it that I wasn't able to pay. And for many months, I wasn't able to pay them. And then, you know, I even told the officer when he was writing me the tickets, um, and he's like, well, if you get this sorted out in the next month, you know, you don't have to worry about these tickets. But, uh, he gave me three different tickets that totaled to like, uh, almost 400 bucks. And, um, I remedied the registration. I was actually able to pay off all the back, you know, tolls and, and, uh, parking tickets that I had on it. Um, but I didn't take care of the tickets. And so now they're actually late, uh, with, if I wait, I'm not going to wait, but if, you know, at the end of this month, then it's going to be a suspension on my license. And the reason why I'm calling is I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, get these tickets thrown out or the fines reduced dramatically because, you know, what you mentioned about the hardship. It's like I'm trying to get above water financially and it feels like I'm being penalized for not having money. It's like a war on the poor. It's, it sucks. I don't know. What, what do you think? And it, it, well, that's the thing. You, you could file to have the judgments vacated, but uh, those are extremely difficult. They do not like throwing out their judgments regardless of how bad they are and how obvious. Because they're, like I've said so many times, there are people who were falsely convicted of rape and DNA completely exonerates them. 
they don't want to change that you know they don't want to admit it you talk about psychopathic and narcissist it's judges refusing to accept that their judgments could be wrong these bastards these monsters put key innocent people in jail just like ken anderson when he was a prosecutor sending an innocent man to jail they don't like overturning these there's extreme resistance to that because they're so narcissistic and any so anytime it's reversed they believe that it reflects on their system as a whole instead of just individuals make mistakes and 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 uh, it, anyway so uh you could do that uh, the most likely thing that's going to happen is they're probably going to force you into a payment schedule. Okay. It, it sucks, that, but that's, that's probably like the most like likely. Like lay down and take it. Well, if in, they because they may uh, suspend a driver's license and a registration, and then you're looking at criminal prosecution if you're stopped. So if if you're okay, right. as an activist and you're okay traveling without a license, and you can get the car registered in someone else's name. Hey, go for it. But just know the risk that you, you know, that, that, that is incurred if, if you do that. Sure. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's too much risk. Um, okay, well, I guess I'll just move right on to my second question. Um, so I have a business that's kind of blossoming now, and I have no intention of paying income taxes for, you know, um, I just want to have like, maybe like a, a piece of advice, you know, how can I maintain that? Or is it something, you know, I mean, do you ever talk to people, business owners about, you know, not paying um, federal income taxes and things like that? Yeah, uh, we talk about how to structure things so that there's no reporting. And if you could do do business without the without the licenses, you are running a risk of, you know, of, of uh, prosecution and having your business shut down mm. by not doing that. But so as long as you're doing it and you understand the risk that's involved, you know, that's fine. And if you, you but you have to know in advance, you have to know if you can structure things in a way that you won't have the reporting. You can still do business without the license. I mean, we know what happened with Bill up in New Hampshire that they didn't give a damn that there was no evidence. They just didn't care. Yeah, and, and he, you know, they admitted, they, they initially said that well, the license was evidence of jurisdiction, and yes, I had him admit that, so if he, you know, I had him admit that they would still claim jurisdiction if he conducted the business without the license. So they, you know, either way, but they, nothing stopped them. Uh, I've done, you know, a number of videos about that. Bill was on for an hour and a half reporting about what had happened. They didn't give a damn. So you have to take that, that, that there's, there's a big risk there. So as long as you understand the risk. But the general thing you have to keep in mind is you have to do what's, what you can to keep people from, that you do business with from reporting you. So as long as there's reports being hmm. made, you're going you're gonna to get a tax, you're going to get a, ref, you know, they're going to, come after you. The computer will generate where's your tax return and other documents. And if you don't respond to those, uh, they may eventually come down to the business. Mm -hmm. So so when you say uh, how to structure it, I mean, is there some specific information? You, are you talking about like, um, you know, um, uh, you know, LLC, I mean, like a, you know, nonprofit or something like that, or no, that's going to have, uh, that's going to have documents with the file with the IRS. If you're going to be 501 C three type of, of business. And then, so there's going to be, there's going to be reporting there. So you want to avoid that. You want to avoid being a corporation because being a corporation, they're going to be expecting it only exists by virtue of the state anyway. So if you're going to do it, do it as some kind of business, do it as a trust, and no, don't, just don't call it a pure trust. Just have a business trust so you have some kind of entity. Uh, just know that to get a bank account to do business, you're going to have to have tax documents. So if you're in you know, traditional banking, I don't know any way around that. I, you know, if, if <clears throat> you can run it through somebody else's account, but that's always a big problem. What about something like uh... the, the Yeah, the structuring... It, it, it's very, very difficult to get into that uh, with specifics because I need to know what kind of business. But you want to be able to avoid licenses, and you're going to have to figure out a way to do banking. Uh, it, it, you know, you may have to run it through somebody else's account. 
Uh, I do know that PayPal, for example, uh, seven years ago, I think it was, they did something where uh, they had to do 1099Ks. So if you got 200 transactions and, tw and more than 20,000, you're going to get a 1099K from the IRS. Well, to the IRS, from PayPal or whatever company it is. So there's not, much what m there's not too much we can do other than to eliminate as much reporting as possible. Because they've got us locked down. And how do you do business without a bank? And you can't do business with a bank anymore without a, without a tax number. So you have, to, you have to minimize the reporting and, and just brace for the, you know, what could be an inevitable computer-generated response. But you know, we've had success with those computer-generated responses. Just know you want to get to those right away. And not just ignore it and let them go. So the sooner you, you know, if you respond to them right away, then you can do pretty well in getting this, these things tossed out. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. So you're saying uh, make it a business trust, avoid uh, any reporting, and uh, is that it? Just like focus on the business trust aspect? Well, the business trust allows you to have an entity so you have kind of an arm's length distance to help shield you. But if you are attacked, they're just going to say it's a sham and, and it's just to avoid paying taxes. So mm -hmm. I'll be sure to call you if that happens. But um, <laughs> let me just so yeah, just don't ignore any like form letters they send. Okay, um, is, do you think something like a credit union would be more effective for this uh, endeavor? I I can't say. A small credit okay. union might, but. You're still going to need, you know, it's, you're still going to need the, you know, a tax ID number on, you know, to get a bank account or a credit union account. There's no getting around the tax number to get a get bank account. That's why uh, it may, you may know somebody that you can help, you know, you can uh, do the PayPal account with and run it through their account. You just have to make sure you can't go over 20,200 transactions or you will get a 1099K. Is that 20,200 transactions every month? No, a year. Oh, okay. Oh, gee. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, hey, they. I, I've been expecting any day now that they would lower that. That they would say that any money, any money that goes through PayPal has to be reported. And I'm sure that's eventually yeah. going to come down the pike. That you know, we'll we'll probably have that. So. Uh, anyway, we're running hmm. low on time, so I got a full line of calls. I think I have my sure, screen yeah, back. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Mark. I really appreciate your work. Keep it up. Hey, no problem. I appreciate the call. Let me know. Uh, let me know what happens with these uh, with these bastards. I will keep you posted. Right. Surely. Appreciate the call. We got Adam in New York City. Infamous wit from Gilbert. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me on. Uh, and my moniker actually has to do with a, a call I alluded to last time we spoke, if you remember. But I, I was surprised you didn't tell uh, advise that gentlemen like everybody else would on LRN, the previous caller, to engage in Bitcoin transactions only if he could. That way the man never can track them down. That's not true. But you don't. Well, I mean, I thought that was the point of Bitcoin. No, Bitcoin is not anonymous. No, Bitcoin is not anonymous. from the man. And it's not anonymous, and they have been, uh, you know, they, they have been taxing it from what I understand, not on a large scale, but they are looking into that, so... And um, right, I always thought they would. I didn't realize they already are. Yeah. As far as I, I know, I mean, I I could be incorrect, that. and and I know somebody on the chat would would let me know, but we don't have any audio on my stream today, which really sucks. Right, but I thought that everything was encrypted on the internet, and that's why people use Bitcoin. Well, it's not anonymous. And the, the blockchain is there for anybody to review, I guess. So if you have the te technological capabilities. Right. Well, I thought anybody that was wanting to hide their monies on the blockchain could by uh, being anonymous, so to speak, a, a gnome de jour or whatever. I thought it was that easy. But then again, I've never used Bitcoin because I don't deal in clandestine activities. But again, that was another reason why I thought Bitcoin had street value is because you could avoid tax, avoid taxes as well. But I stand corrected now that now I, you've answered your my question uh, sufficiently about Bitcoin. Uh, what I was calling about, and not a ticket, but I was thinking about power and the way a man can use it or be destroyed by it. And uh, that's from nothing shocking. 
if you know the LP. And my other favorite line on that, one of my other favorite lines on that LP is, uh, some people should die, that's just unconscious knowledge. Now, I so, think you so don't wait, agree wait, with that, because you're, you're not a supporter of the death penalty. You, so you're not only into Pink Floyd, you're into Jane's addiction? I think nothing shocking is the dark side of the moon of my era. You know, I highly I think of that album. I actually, to this day, can't stand the the song Jane says, because it was my only reference at the time. You know, I was a kid, but it was my only reference for Jane's addiction, and so I turned down the opportunity to see them play on Long Island, and this was 1989 or 88. And it wasn't until after the show when a friend came back and told me, and I got, and I actually got to hear nothing shocking and 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 uh, uh, two days from the, the second album that Jane's Addiction is one of my favorite uh, favorite groups, and Dave Navarro is, I, I think, uh, it's got to be almost like my top fifteen ultimate guitar players. I completely agree with you. He's up there with David Gilmore, and the lyricism lyricism by Perry Farrell is up there with Roger Waters. Uh, anyway, not to get sidetracked, I'm glad you dig the LP, because Chains, Chains says is the only overplayed song on that album, or, as it's funny you mentioned it. Well, they could have played... one of the greater songs on the album. But, but they, they could have played... And it's three days. Come on, Ted. <laughs> they they could have played Come on, Ted. Uh, I think that's the name of it. Ted just admitted is what I just quoted. Yeah, uh, that's... It's, it's being... Um, no, I didn't quote it, uh, by the way, but it's, yeah, I, I, again, I'd want to, I'd love to rap with you in the bar about my love for Jane's Addiction and my passing up the opportunity to see them a little bit later than that when I was a sophomore in college, you know, to see them at a dive bar in Tempe. Yeah, or wherever they were playing, Celebrity Theater? No, they weren't playing big gigs yet. Uh, anyway, uh, again, power. And uh, I, I loved your overdubs, by the way, of my last call on the Internet. And I should like to speak to you about them, but I, I, I am right to infer that you are anti-death penalty. I am. Right, and I'm not. That's why things like, I don't think, uh, the use of atomic weaponry in the time of war is violative of, of morality or ethics, and the ends do justify the means. This is what I'm uh, calling to continue discussion with you about. The ends justify the means. Since you put it on there, and for the audience, you put it on the Internet, you quoted Hayek. The principle that the ends justifies the means uh, is in an individualist ethics regarded as the denial of all morals. In collectivist ethics, of which I was defending, it becomes necessarily the supreme rule. Well, I couldn't disagree more with the latter comment by a latter assertion of faith by Friedrich Hayek any more than you could imagine. So I'm calling to disagree with you since you posted it. And there were two other brilliant quotes you put on the internet in relation to my call and where I'm coming from that were brilliant retorts that I'd like to discuss with you as well. First, I just want to say about Hayek, I don't know where he arrives at it, the, the belief that it becomes necessary in a just and verdant and a civilized society collectivist norms don't need to be imposed on evildoers because evil no doers wouldn't exist. And that's why we dropped two atomic weapons on the evil empire of Japan. They literally had murdered 20 million people up to the last day that little boy was dropped on them. And they said, we quit. We're done murdering people. We'll get out of the foreign territories we invaded and been occupying for almost three decades. So, uh, I'm going on a rant here, but that's why I believe the ends justify the means, because you can see how much better the world was the day the evil empire. Japan had their military uh, industrial complex literally shut down forever. And I want to remark about what you astonished me when you mentioned General MacArthur, an appeal to an authority that you would never make ever in any other subject. You would never say General MacArthur said this and then declare your your moral point, viewpoint superior to, that, to mine or be able to call anything I believe immoral by citing General MacArthur with the exception of his agreeing with you or you agreeing with him that it was unnecessary to drop the bombs they'd already lost and they weren't going to surrender. But 
that's a counterfactual. MacArthur, you or me cannot prove or disprove. Well, it wasn't just MacArthur. Talking, it, it, MacArthur just happened to be right. the, the the Allied commander in in the Pacific, and it was based on uh, reports from other generals and officers in the field, and that it was generally agreed to that they were ready to surrender. So, what it comes down right, to, wait, let me wait, 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 wait. No, I, I let you, I let you go for a while. So, so let me right, right let, me, let me speak. What, what this turns uh, on is authority. what it turns on is. Was the dropping of the bombs truly defensive? And if they were ready to give up and they were already ready to surrender, then it wasn't defensive. And if it wasn't defensive, then it was not morally justified. And so we may so not know. It was an know. offensive maneuver. We're, we totally disagree on terms to begin with. It was an offensive maneuver. I don't call it a defensive uh, dropping bombs on japan in 1945 when their armies weren't coming over to california anytime soon and in fact of course never were going to they had lost the war i totally agree with you there but they were murdering people every single day up until the day nagasaki happened and they said we surrender they literally were murdering people and chopping people up every single day until august uh, 11th when did they uh, 1945 when they when they said we quit we surrender okay, I, they were murdering people up to that i don't remember the exact date so they, but if, if the intelligence was that they were ready to surrender, and, and I know because communications weren't as good then as now because there were a lot of Japanese that were on some of these islands that didn't even know the war was over. But if, if the army, if Hirohito was really ready to surrender, which we may not know for sure, I'll give you that, then it, was, you know, then it wasn't justified. And... and and I'll give you that. I don't uh, normally. I will. I, I won't I, normally. You anything I just said, by the way, I heard I, everything I, you said. Let me respond to that. It, the point was not to argue the necessity of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but to argue that it was moral. That's where I'm coming from. And you, I want you to argue and tell me why it's immoral without making an appeal to authority that you would never otherwise appeal to generals, so to speak. Because it fascinates me that an anti-war, anti-statist person such as yourself would literally first reflex would be to cite a man whose authority you would never respect in any other regard. Well, any comments? I'm not... I'm saying that he and other people who were involved who know a lot better than I do and other people because they were on the ground there, they're saying that they were ready to surrender. The intelligence was they were ready to surrender. Now, based on that, which I grant to you may not be correct, it's not absolute, and, and I don't think I'm making an appeal to authority. I'm not saying it's right because he said so. But if they were ready to give up, and I'm talking about the moral aspect, if they were, the government was ready to stop and they were ready to surrender, then it, then it wasn't necessary to drop the bombs. And I'm saying if it wasn't necessary to stop them, then it wasn't moral. Only if it was necessary okay. to stop them from doing what they were doing. But if it was necessary to stop them from doing what they were doing by dropping atomic weaponry on them before they finally said, we do quit, we surrender, are you saying that it, it is a moral argument or it is absolutely not a moral argument? I'm saying, of course, I think it's a moral argument that your, your, your only retort so far have been to appeals to authority. You it's did not it an appeal to an authority. Okay me. It's all not right, an appeal. Right. I'm saying if the intelligence was correct, we, we, that not only it's not just him, I wasn't alive. In 1945, I, I have you to go. Bi let me. You got. Don't let me speak. I'm giving you a lot of latitude here. I'm letting you speak, and I'm not. Okay, I'm not interrupting you. Go ahead. No, you don't need to. I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. I'm saying that based on historical reports, if they are correct, and I know this conflicting. If they're correct and it wasn't necessary, you also, and if it wasn't necessary, it wasn't moral. The other thing too is was such an overwhelming amount of force necessary? Could it have been conducted where there were less, uh, uh, less uh, civilian casualties? And they, I don't know, I would say, I would err on the, on the side that it probably was accomplished, it, they probably could have accomplished it without those two bombs. Okay. I, I doesn't negate or tell me whether or not you're telling me you think it is an absolute immorally uh, moral thing the United States of America did, whoever commanded it, Truman, or if it isn't. But uh, I, I submit to the audience, uh, I don't mean to belabor the point, your original 
objections to my citing Nagasaki and Hiroshima was you immediately said General MacArthur, and then you doubled down on it and said the, the group of generals and intelligence. All actors, state actors you're referring to, and then any other time, you're completely anti-statist, and I totally respect that, but I'm just saying. Uh, no. The next point I want to get to... Uh, but wait, 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 about- wait, 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 let me put you on hold for a second. No. I do not automatically, and I've said this before, I don't automatically reject it just because they may be uh, in government that what they're saying is wrong. They are liars. They are criminals. Yes, not everything they say is is, is wrong. They, 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 you can have independent sources verify what they're saying, just like with the FBI. The FBI is a disgraceful immoral criminal organization. Just look at COINTELPRO, for one. They, in fact, they were pressuring Martin Luther King to kill himself. Uh, what they did with COINTELPRO, if that's the only example, uh, and, and horrible organization. Does that mean that every prosecution that the FBI is involved with is false? That the people that are being accused of, of doing uh, of terrorist acts or whatnot are all automatic? No, I don't think that. No. I'm going to look at what the evidence says. But here, what you're talking about Neither side, neither one of us is going to know for sure if the intelligence was accurate and that those two bombs were necessary to be dropped. Neither one of us can say with any certainty, no one can say with any certainty today, that it was necessary to drop those two bombs. And that's why looking at at, at, at the history of the United States government, given how the awful things that they have done on a regular basis. And that's not excusing what the Japanese did. What the Japanese did to the Chinese is absolutely horrific and the, and the, and the stuff of nightmares. I don't like to think about that stuff. But because we don't know for sure, I don't think either one of us can make a, a judgment that it was absolutely immoral or absolutely moral. I think that given the history of the United States government, I would say that just like I trust Smedley Butler when he said that the that there were businessmen trying to overthrow the United States government in the mid thirties, I take him. I think I, I, I think he, he he has you know he was probably telling the truth. So here, I don't think I would say based on the history, I am going to take it with a grain of salt that MacArthur and that intelligence was right that they were tra- that they wanted to surrender and they didn't have to drop those bombs. To sum up your argument, very well put, by the way, it's the government may not always be right, but they're not always wrong, and therefore I'm going to cite them when it suits my issue. That's fine with me. Uh, you may not like that summation, but I believe that's what it is, and I appeal to the, the audience uh, to be fair. They don't have to agree with me. That's not the point of my calls ever. I prefer clarity to agreement. And I like to shoot the shit with somebody that has an in- integrity and is willing to have his deepest beliefs challenged if somebody like Witt, the infamous Witt, doesn't agree with you. Uh, but about uh, the FBI and... we got to be quick. i got a lot of callers. That's the best, best appeal to authority I can think of that any libertarian makes, this Medley Butler. So you're with him on prohibition? No, of course you're not. And he thought the same thing at the same time. Uh, it's Again, I wanted to talk to you about things you put on the Internet. And uh, the other one was from some Australian... Uh, diplomat or politician I never heard of that was pretty good. Statism is the utopian ideal that just that just the right amount of violence used by just the right people in just the right way can perfect society. Now I don't know any status except for leftists that and utopians and diehard progressives progressives that believe there's such thing as perfect society. I sure as heck don't think there's such thing as a perfect society. That's why another reason why I support the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They learned the the evil people that went to work every day, men and women, and the unfortunate slaves in Hiroshima and Nagasaki for almost three decades, building weaponry and planning assaults on innocent human beings to murder them, to take their land and their crap. Mass murder went on for two decades before the United States of America put an end to it in a ho- two horrible days. That in one month in Nanking, the Japs murdered and chopped to death and raped and tortured more people in Nanking than combined uh, casualties of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, I, I don't and think that, that that's – I don't think those numbers are true. Before. But I, but I do appreciate the call. Okay. It, it just I, I only have 10 minutes left, and I have like eight more callers to get to. I hear you. I'm not complaining. Thanks for taking me on. I appreciate the I'd call. i to talk to you at length. All right. We'll, have, be, we'll be live on Saturday again, so uh, appreciate the I'm call. I'm not going to be calling on Saturdays anytime soon. 
Okay. I'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to do my. Uh, I, we'll move on. We've got area code four one two. You're live on the No State Project. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Kevin. I'm calling from Pittsburgh. I'm sorry. What was your name? Uh, Kevin. Kevin from Pittsburgh. What do you have for us today? Hey, uh, Doc Wallen's playing here tonight. If you're wondering. Um, I got a, I turned right on a red light and, um, yeah, I got a ticket for that. Um, I was actually in the city, but it's like right on the border and the suburban cop gave me a ticket and, uh, I had a hearing uh, like last week or two weeks ago, but he found me guilty anyways, even though I had proof that I was, uh, it's actually city property, but the cop said, that uh, his borough, we take care of the roads. We salt it and fill the potholes. He goes, so he, that was his reasoning. He was allowed to give me a ticket. Well, usually they have agreements and, uh, between cities, and they're able to do that, so it probably uh, You mean, so even if it's on the border, the suburban cop is still allowed to give me a ticket for going through the red light? Uh, they probably have an agreement with the county so that they can do that, or another the other city, yeah. You have to check. I know they have uh, that. I know. I know for a fact they have that in Arizona. So a Mesa cop, if he uh, if okay. he sees somebody, if he sees somebody going, you know, driving over the border, and you know, let's say he's speeding, he doesn't have to stop at the border or Chandler just because you know they have an agreement that 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 in certain situations like that they can give a ticket and, and stop somebody making an arrest. Okay, uh, the judge offered me a deal. Well, he's, he's, I asked if I could cross-examine him, and he said, I already find you guilty. And he said, I'll give you a deal. He goes, for $40 more, he'll switch it to a parking ticket, and there'd be no points. And uh, I said, I just filed the appeal, because the appeal is like 100 bucks, so I figured I'd rather try again. So he found you guilty. More. He found you guilty and didn't allow you to cross-examine the cop at all? No, he said, he already found me guilty. Well, so, so that's so you had you didn't, did the cop testify? Uh, yeah, the, he when I first went in, he uh, he goes, so what's your problem? He goes, is it the points or is it the money? And I said, uh, no, it's because uh, this happened in the city. It didn't even happen. You know where he's saying it happened, and uh, I had a map from the city. I talked to the guy who runs the Department of City Planning in the city, and he sent me a map, and he said, yeah, it's definitely in the city. So I just handed that to the judge, and he goes, well, well I'm going to let the cop, whatever, testify. And then, uh, But he didn't allow you cop, to cross-examine you know. him? No, huh? as soon as the cop was done talking, he, he just offered me the deal. And then I said, do I get to cross-examine the cop? And he said, I already found you guilty. Yeah, then, I would. Yeah, I would. Goes, yeah, that's take the deal. That's the that's your main thing on cross. That you know, I, I, on appeal is the denial of cross. You, you the, he allowed the cop to testify and didn't allow cross. This is a no brainer. That this it is a slam dunk appeal. I mean, this this judge wasn't even trying. Wow. Do I now when I fill out the appeal paperwork? Do, I just, do you just write that on the appeal paperwork, or what do I do now? Well, and uh, oh, it's Pennsylvania. Well, uh, they may uh, they may actually order a new trial for this one, but yeah, you could put it in your appeal. You know, they probably do at this level an informal appeal brief. You have to check the rules. I know it's it, it sucks in, in Pennsylvania the way the court system is. It's it it's bad. Um, but yeah, you'd put it in your appeal brief, and you could just make the appeal brief less than ten pages, where. Or you you know you just lay out what happened. He let the cop testify. He found you guilty and refused to allow you to do a cross. That's a no-brainer, open and shut. Hopefully they just throw it out and they don't order a new trial. Is there a way to file the appeal without paying that hundred dollar fee, or do I still got to pay that fee? Uh, you can get it waived or deferred. They want How their money. There's nothing else we can do to avoid that. The only other time you can avoid something like that, if it's criminal, then depending on where you are, like Arizona, they can't require a filing fee when it's criminal. But if it's a minor thing like this, it's probably not considered criminal, and they're going to want their fee. And again, if you uh, okay. waive it, get it waived or get it deferred is going to be the only two options. 
And uh, should I file like a motion to dismiss also, or should I just file that appeal brief? Well, you can file a motion to vacate the decision based on a denial of due process and that there's no evidence of jurisdiction and judge clearly denied due process because he didn't even give you a trial. He didn't allow cross-examination. So you want to file the two of them. So this way, if he grants the motion to dismiss, it moots the appeal. It's not a big deal. But if he denies the motion to dismiss and doubles down on his (laughs) denial of cross-examination, then you can, you know, it's obviously something you can then use on the appeal that the judge the judge was given the opportunity to do the right thing, and he, and he, and he doubled down instead. All right. Yeah, I guess that's all. Um, do you sell, like, the motion to vacate a decision? And uh, I know you have the motion to dismiss. Well, yeah, if you want, the, yeah, I can, I can send you the template for the motion to vacate. Just email me after the show. Okay. All right, I guess that's all. All right, thanks, Mark. All right, appreciate it. Kevin in Pittsburgh, so good luck with that. We're going to do a role-playing session, so we should be able to get that up on themarkstevens.net also. So uh, I will be live on Saturday, streaming right here on my YouTube channel. Hopefully we get this this, uh, problem taken care of. And uh, so we'll get to anybody that we were not able to get to today. So till next time, salute.